What is up, team? Well, if it's a decent look by DePaul, there's a good chance it's going in, and it's a good chance it's a decent look. So any shot from DePaul. Seemed like it was a good look tonight. Um, where to start? All right, where to start? You give up 99 points to DePaul, and there's very few things you could do well enough to erase. All right, you give up 99 points to any team, and there's very few things you could do to make it a good performance. All right, from the onset, DePaul was getting uh, pretty much every shot they wanted from the guys who they want shooting them. David Jones, who wasn't even their leading scorer, but a guy who had 21 points, was going left, going left, going left, going left, going left. And the next time down, guess where he was going, folks? Going left. Over and over again. And in the second half, when Freeman Liberty got going, all right, that one three he hit from about 30 feet unguarded. It's not like it was a great look, but it sure as hell got him going. And then from there, I think he hit four more threes, and he was just going to the basket, and we were speeding him up. We were trying to get in his shorts 95 feet away from the basket. He was by posh right away, and then it's just full speed ahead towards the basket, speeding up a player who likes to get sped up. You know, I know that's our game plan. I know we've had some success when we have success doing that, speeding teams up, pressuring them 94 feet. But DePaul's a team that lives in the chaos just as well. So you got to be able to concede sometimes and to adjust and uh, change the way you're going to play depending on the opponent, especially depending on the opponents doing in that game in particular. It would be one thing if the pressure was, uh, you know, really getting to DePaul and making it unbearable and it was offsetting some of those good looks they were getting. But tonight they were getting good looks and the few turnovers we were able to force in the second half never gave us enough momentum to get over the hump. Now, there was other issues involved, of course. Offensively, we struggled to make the easy ones. We still scored 94 points, though. Defensively is where we lost that game, and that's an obvious point, an obvious point. And we tried a few different things. We did go zone a few times in the second half, but it didn't, didn't look great. All right, but at least we gave that a look, right? People are begging for adjustments. We went to zone. We showed a matchup zone in the second half a few different occasions. It did not look any better than the man. The pressure tonight, you know, I, I, it wasn't great, and I, I think – execution or you know tactically uh wasn't wouldn't be my first choice tonight um against a DePaul team that kind of wants to be sped up but still if you're gonna go go out and use it you got to execute better than that I mean we were getting beat first move off the dribble and it was just you know fast break down the court and the half court our, our man-to-man -man defense in the half court was just as bad we were getting beat getting blown by in the first half in zone you know he's just a freshman just bouncing back he's gonna have growing pains I really like him, but he was getting beat time after time, you know, going right by him for buckets. Uh, Smith, he's really heady, can can really slide his feet and sell a charge better than anybody else on the team, but he doesn't have the defensive abilities that Wusu or Mathis have in terms of bodying up guys in the half court. You know, um, I don't think there's a coincidence that Wusu didn't play as much minutes tonight and we happen to have our worst defensive performance in a while. All right, he doesn't do a lot of things offensively that piss people off because he's not, you know, a scorer in many ways, but he does a lot of things well. Tonight he was three for three, seven points. Um, probably played less than Mathis, less than Smith. I didn't think Smith or Mathis played particularly terrible. Mathis didn't hit many shots. Uh, Smith didn't hit many shots till the end, but um, they didn't stand out anyway. And tonight um, our collective um depth in the sense of that there's no one you know there we have a very similar uh skill level one through we should say th three through nine you know four through nine right now take away champ wheeler and posh who are standing out at the top of the um the team the rest of the guys are really bunched up and we were going to all of them tonight none of them stood out and no one really got comfortable because of it so yeah you can blame the coach for you know not getting guys in rhythm because of substitution patterns that's well within your right to complain about that but there's times when it works doesn't it there's times when our pressure and our substitution patterns lead to big second half uh spurts and um blowout wins like we saw against xavier and depaul and scene hall all right that was times when we had weird subs in the first half and you're like what's going on well in the second half you see how it wears teams down tonight it didn't tonight it did not so go ahead and have that coach um uh, one thing you can definitely talk about is the lack of timeouts. We didn't use our first timeout till five minutes left in the, in the game. We didn't use one all the first half, and not till five minutes left in the game did he call a timeout. And we were down the whole game, giving up multiple runs. DePaul had uh, a 10-point lead for you know multiple uh, times before that timeout was even called. So there's no excuse there. 
maybe the plan is you don't want to give up uh, momentum. You don't want to let teams give a, get a break. You hope that your pressure eventually breaks them and you don't want to let them, you know, catch their wind. But there were so many times where we needed to regroup. We needed to gather ourselves. We needed to talk about getting some stops and not call a timeout until five minutes left in the second half is uh, a, a miscarriage of justice, if you ask me. Um, people are going to talk about that Wheeler sub in the first half. Listen, he was the last guy to come out of the game. Um, I think he sat for too long. It wasn't like he was, you know, he had three great dunks. I was thinking he was playing great. I didn't think it was egregious to take him out. It was seven minutes into the game. He was the last sub, last person to come out. I thought he sat for too long. That's the problem. All right, but the sub is bound to happen. And, you know, it wasn't like he was hitting a bunch of crazy shots. He got some good looks at the baskets, at the basket. Would I have hated to see him stay in the game? No, but I'm not going to crucify him for it either. Um, free throws did not help us. Again, we were 13 for 22. DePaul was 30 or 26 for 38. So we, we did put him at the line some at the end there. But for the most part, I thought we were getting the short end of the stick at play at fouls at the rim. We were attacking the basket for the most part in the game. And uh, there was a lot of 50-50 calls that went their way. Uh, it wasn't a, wasn't the difference in the game. Who knows if we even make those free throws. We haven't showed a propensity to be able to do that anyway. But I did think that, uh, you know, if there was a direction in which way that game was officiated, it was tilted towards DePaul. Still, at home, DePaul being, you expect a little bit of an edge there. Can't complain about it too much. It wasn't the reason we lost. We lost. We can also point to missed layups. Of course, it was a St. John's basketball game. Of course, there was missed layups. But again, the defense is the reason we lost this game. 99 points to a DePaul team. That's just not that good. All right. And uh, it was your game plan or your lack of execution within that game plan that uh, gave them the Freeman freedom or whatever the fuck you want to say to do that, to do that. 39 points to a guy uh, almost gave a 40 to the second DePaul player within three year span is just crazy. But it's just so St. John's. But listen. You know, my contention has never been that Mike Anderson is an amazing basketball coach. Um, I do think talks of having him fired are very, very premature. I think that, you know, in all honesty, if you were going to ask St. John's administration, his seat is far from even warm. Doesn't mean I think he's, you know, above reproach or you can't question things he does. Doesn't mean that there's things that make me question what's going on. Doesn't mean that I'm not yelling at the TV. I'm not pissed off. But firing him is really, really premature. All right. And there's things that we're overlooking um, in terms of what what good he's done or what good he's capable of because we think for whatever reason, this recent play means he's going to fail at St. John's no matter what. All right. I think that um, at his very best, he's more than good enough for St. John's. And at his very worst, he's better than a lot of worse we've seen at St. John. Okay. And this one season of... Very, very underwhelming play, disappointing play, failing to meet expectations play isn't reason to just throw the baby out and give up, all right? Baby about the bathwater, whatever the phrase you want to use. It's not uh, the smartest decision to just wipe the slate clean and bring in a new guy. You know, let's bring in an up-and-comer and let, and let him try it at St. John's. Let's bring in an improving guy from somewhere else, so let's have him try it at St. John's. All right, it's not like Mike Anderson hasn't had success other places. All right, it's not like he hasn't proven he can win. All right, does, he, does that mean he can't fail here? No, absolutely not. We, we know any coach can fail at St. John's. But I don't think he's proven he can't win at St. John's and to give up now after being this close. All right, everyone here was super excited for this season. All right, everyone here thought this team had realistic expectations to be really good, which means Coach Anderson built a team where everyone thought was good enough to be really good two and a half seasons in. All right? So if he built that team, why can't we think he's capable of building a team? Why don't we think he's capable of continuing to build teams we'll be excited about? All right? And then we'll catch some breaks when that season comes around. Because we sure as hell didn't catch him this year. And that's some of it on the coach, then some of it on just the breaks that happen in college basketball. I point to it on Twitter. Coach Cooley's going to win Big East Coach of the Year. He's got, a, he's got a case for National Coach of the Year. If you watch Providence play, Bynum, I've seen him hit three End of shot clock, buzzer beating, heaves in huge situations to lead to wins. We saw him hit three in just the St. John's game. I've seen him hit two in other games recently. All right. That's not coaching. All right. Those are breaks that happen throughout a game and they have huge, huge, um, you know, they lead to huge results in these outcomes of these games. Nothing to do with coaching. And now Coach Cooley, everyone's worshiping the ground he's walking on. 
There's been years recently where Pit- Providence fans were so pissed off they wanted him gone. All right, and there's been years where Michigan wanted him as their head coach. Then he comes back around and has disappointing results. All right, so a lot of it is just the um, what, what the expectations lead to. And Coach Anderson, after having exceeded expectations last year and having bring in transfers that everyone bought into the hype train, I remember telling you guys in the offseason, don't do, don't do, don't expect an absolute uh, positive trade for just transfers swapped in and out. All right, we knew it would take time. We knew there's things that would uh, come negatively because of a, a huge roster t- turnover. It wasn't going to be easy, but people bought into the hype. People said, you know, here's an an easy tournament team. Here's a team that should finish top of the Big East, towards the top of the Big East. All right, you shouldn't be this surprised where you're ready to fire the coach over it. Be upset, absolutely. Be upset. Question what he's doing. But to root for losses halfway through his third season, after you know worshiping in the ground he was on less than a year ago, it's just insanity. All right, it doesn't show the capability of making any sane decisions. All right. Shows you make rash decisions that you go back and change four months later when the outcome goes the opposite way. How about you take a seat and relax? How about you let a guy who's won over 400 games in his career keep trying to build a program towards the right direction? Because although we have took a step, a step back this year, I still feel as the program we are slowly trending in a positive direction. And that's means we have expectations that we didn't meet this year. But next year, we're going to have some expectations too. And he's a professional basketball coach who's doing his best to build a program his way. And everyone who's been here for multiple seasons gets better. You could say Champ's in a slump. Yeah, he's in a slump. All right? I don't think he's a terrible player all of a sudden. I still think he's done great things at St. John's. And he's gotten much better throughout his time here. Okay, I think Pasha Musu have gotten better throughout their time here. I think Wheeler has gotten better at St. John's than he showed at Purdue. I think Mathis, as frustrating as he is, and I knew he'd be frustrating coming in, is having the best season of his career. Okay, so if guys stay here, they get better. Does he have to get guys to stay here? Absolutely. But it's not like he's got multiple seasons of losing guys that we wanted to stay here. Last year was a surprise. It was the first type of season in, in NCAA basketball history where guys could just transfer any way they wanted. All right, if it continues like that and we continue to have mass turnovers, that's an issue. I don't think we necessarily can say he's a failure in terms of getting transfers in and out. I like Soriano. I hope Wheeler sticks around. I love him now. All right, Mathis, he's got another year. We'll see what happens. Smith has had his moments. He hasn't performed to the level that most people want him to perform at. All right, he came from a lower level conference. The competition level has proven to be tough for him, especially on the defensive end. But it's not like he's been completely useless. So I think if Coach Anderson is able to have a full team of upperclassmen that are guys he recruited and the guys who have been in the system for more than a season, of which we have one guy on this here this team that has been in the system for more than one season. All right. And some of that is his fault. He's not, you know, clear of all that. He's got to be able to keep guys. He's got to work harder to keep those guys in the system. I wish we still have Williams. I wish we still have Marcellus. Guys that were system players and guys that have been around on winning teams. So, you know, he's not, he doesn't walk on water, all right? I'm not going to give him 10 years of mediocrity. But I don't think it'd be even fair to discuss firing him right now. And you could say he sucks as a coach, and I'm not going to have an argument whether or not he's a good coach or a great coach. There's things he does that piss me off, all right? But he's won enough places for us to objectively say he's not nearly as bad is the most, you know, ardent haters say he is. And I'm sure there's some guys who will say he's an amazing coach. I'm not agreeing with them either. But I think the most egregious offense would be think firing him after this third year at St. John's uh, would be a good decision. But enough of me getting it on my soapbox. All right, let's talk about some positive. Tosh Alexander had a great game. Wheeler had another really good game. All right, Stanley shows promises. I missed the Creighton game. All right. I was busy buying a house. Excuse me. I had a freaking good day that day. All right. When you guys were all pissed off about the Creighton game, I'm sorry I missed it. But Stanley was seven for eight. That's a great sign. I love that kid. I think he's got a bright future. Keeping him is high on the priority list for next year's season. All right. Keeping Posh, Wusu, Stanley, Soriano, Wheeler, Pinzone. That's really the priority list heading the next year. Um, and I'm not giving up on the uh, on a run possibly in the Big East tournament this season. 
Xavier coming at home. They need a win just as much as we do. All right. They owe us for the beat down. We beat them at their place. That'll be tough to get. But every win in the Big East is tough to get. So there's no excuses there. You got to take care of business at home like you couldn't do against Creighton. All right. You sweep Xavier. That's a, a nice chip in your pocket. Then it would line it up for you to be in the seventh seed in the Big East where you play, uh, if you happen to beat DePaul, play Villanova in the second round, which is weird. You know, usually you think you'd avoid Villanova for not playing that one in the second round, but tough breaks, right? You can't complain if you're St. John's. But let's get hot. Let's finish the season strong. Uh, let's get some momentum going forward. Uh, feel free to tell me Coach Anderson's the worst coach in the world. I disagree with you there. Feel free to tell me he's not the best. We'd have some agreements. Feel free to tell me there's better coaches out there. I completely agree. Feel free to tell me, um, you know, St. John's made a mistake when they hired him. You might have some argument there, but they have him, and I don't think it'd be smart to fire him now, 100%. Anyway, thanks for listening. Um, for Omar Cook, this has been Pat Kane. You've been listening to the Red Storm Rapid Reaction Podcast. Good night, Steve Lavin. Peace.